Welcome back to Homesteading with the Zimmermans, where we work hard and play hard on our little corner of land in Iowa. My husband and I were born and raised Old Order Mennonite, or Horse and Buggy Mennonite, as some refer to them as. And although we are no longer part of that culture or community, we are intentional about passing on the old-fashioned skills of our childhood to the next generation. Hello, um, this is Ruth Ann Zimmerman for Homesteading with the Zimmermans and in today's video we are going to talk about pressure canning. Most of you know by now that um, I grew up Old Order Mennonite, which is similar to Amish in many ways and it's a common misconception that Amish and Mennonites across the board do not use pressure canners. And while some of that is true, there is a lot of Amish and Mennonites that do not own a pressure canner and they fill their shelves with low acid foods by water bathing. My mom, however, taught me how to pressure can and I am very comfortable around a pressure canner. And today I'm going to talk about how I was taught to pressure can. And on my Instagram, my Instagram is Ruth Ann Zim. People are fearful of pressure canning and they're fearful of two different things according to the questions I get in my Instagram question box. The two things that they're most fearful about, fearful about is poisoning their families with botulism and the other thing that they're fearful about is that the whole pressure canner will just blow up. So I'm going to address those two biggest fears. In the description, I'm going to link, put a link to a printable cheat sheet, just like I did last week with the water bath canning. I'm going to put a printable pressure canning cheat sheet so you can print it out and put it with all your other recipes that you've been printing from my videos. And I will be putting the link to all of my videos where I actually do pressure can. So in most of those videos, you're going to see me using this old all-American pressure canner. Now, the story behind this pressure canner is when I got married, um, my, I was my mom's fifth child. So by the time I got married, um, she was looking at having only four children left at home where she previously would have had, you know, nine. And she said, I don't need two pressure canners anymore. Why don't you take one? Because you'll need one. And this is that pressure canner. We've been married for 23 years. I have used it every summer. And it, the reason it looks so rough is because I do most of my canning outdoors on the Camp Chef and the Camp Chef doesn't burn real clean. So the bottoms get black. I used it up until this summer and the bottom looks a little rough and has a couple nicks in that had me a little concerned. So for the last couple years, I only used it outdoors because it had a, has a couple pock marks in the bottom that I knew would compromise the strength of the cast aluminum. This summer at a yard sale, I found a Presto pressure canner, brand new in the box. So I snagged that one thinking, oh good, now I have two pressure canners, which will really help things move along on those big canning days. Well, I pressure canned one day using both of them. And then this cast aluminum, this old cast aluminum one. So this is the pressure gauge for the old cast aluminum one. And, or this is the steam vent. And after steam comes out of here for so long and then you, you flip it down and that traps all the steam inside and that's when you start watching your gauge. Well, this broke off and because they don't make them like this anymore, I was not able to replace this little part and I neither did I want to. This one can now be retired and the, the glass, the plastic came off of this. Not quite sure what I'm gonna do with this old one, but it is now retired. I no longer use this one. So I bought myself this brand new all American pressure canner. And yes, they're very expensive, but I know that within one season of canning, I will have more than saved the $400 that this costs. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between the Presto and the All-American. And now I haven't used this one yet, but it's going to be very similar to this old one that I have used. Okay, let's start by comparing the two pressure canners. This one, the pros and cons of each one. This one, a con of this one is that it's a lot more expensive. This one I think is between four and five hundred dollars depending on which model you get. And this one is a whole lot cheaper. So the Presto is actually under two hundred dollars. So they're both 23 quarts. The thing that makes me feel safer about this one is the fact that I feel like I'm doing something when I'm tightening these down. I feel like I'm taking an extra safety measure when I can physically tighten these screws and somehow maybe keep it from exploding. Whereas this one, you just lock into place like this. And now because the handles are lined up, this one is locked and ready to start building pressure. It has these things that lock it into place. And I think largely because my mom didn't have one like this is why I feel more comfortable like this because my mom always used one like this where you screw the things, you, you screw these tight. And where this one has a rubber, rubber seal that keeps your steam trapped, and I, stro I, I don't struggle, but I got to keep that rubber seal clean to make sure I get a tight seal. And this one just goes aluminum against aluminum and seals that way. No rubber seal to keep clean th in this one. So the biggest difference that I have noticed between these two, and it helped me learning to can with my Presto this summer, has helped me to understand some of the questions that I get on my Instagram because a lot of people keep asking me, why does all my pressure canned food siphon? Like, why is it siphoning? And I never experienced a lot of siphoning. I mean, of course, the occasional jar here and there. But with all the jars that I can, can in my pressure canner, I cannot say that siphoning in the All-American was a huge problem. But what I learned with the Presto is because it is stainless steel and the sides are thin, when you reach the appropriate time for what you're canning and you turn your burner off to let the pressure come back down, the pressure drops so dramatically, the pressure and the temperature drops so dramatically in this lighter pot that your jars boil over. And like I covered last week, when you have siphoning, then you can get particles of food that get stuck be between your lid and your jar. And then that can either cause your jar to not seal at all, or your seal won't be long lasting and you'll go you know, into your pantry in a couple weeks and you'll see that you have some spoiled jars of food. And that happened to me when I was doing green beans. Had these side by side and I noticed right away that the pressure, when I turned the burners off, the pressure on the Presto dropped a lot faster than the pressure on the All-American. So I open it up to remove my jars and I'm like, oh, this is kind of nice because this will save me time because I don't have to wait so long for the pressure gauge to come back to zero. But when I opened it, what did I find? All my jars were just, all the liquid in the green beans was just boiling out. And I marked those and I had two out of seven that didn't seal at all. So the other five I marked and sure enough, within a couple weeks, that seal was gone and they were all spoiled and I had to throw them out. So, however, don't throw this one out all the way. Don't throw your Presto out. You can work with it. What I started doing is instead of turning my burner off when I reached the, the time that I needed, the allotted time that I needed, I just slowly backed the burner down. So instead of turning the burner off like I do for my All-American, I just you know turned it to medium for a while and then just slowly turned it off that way. Now, part of the issue could have been that I am canning outside on my camp chef and the camp chef, 
Camp Chef has a lot more BTUs, which is heat units, than your kitchen stove would. Because the All-American is cast aluminum, it's like a cast iron pan. It cools down so slowly, and which takes up more time, but it also causes a lot less siphoning. So that is another con versus pro. But if you don't have $500 to invest, it's okay. You can still work with this one. If you have a lot of siphoning, just learn to back your heat down real slow. The question is, do I can on my glass cooktop with the pressure canner? I absolutely do. But for the last 15 years, I've been canning on my glass cooktop. So one of the reasons that glass cooktop stoves say that they don't recommend canning on them is because like say the All-American is very heavy um, and some of the older models of glass cooktops were not designed for that kind of weight and that it could damage the glass cooktop. Um, however, I also use cast iron on my glass cooktop and I'm just very careful. I don't slide it around. I pick it up, move it off and I'm not banging it around on my um, you know, glass cooktop. But between the two, if I had a glass cooktop and that was my only place to can, I would definitely go with the Presto because it's a lot lighter. And I don't ever use two at a time on my glass cooktop. If I'm canning, I'm usually not putting anything on any of the other burners because I don't wanna trap a whole bunch of heat under my glass cooktop. And that is another reason they say not to use a glass cooktop for canning is because a lot of heat can get trapped under that glass cooktop and damage it. So let's talk a little bit about the fear behind pressure canning or canning food in general. Fear comes from things that we don't fully understand. And sometimes people try to take our fear away by giving us rules and guidelines so that we're not fearful, but sometimes the rules and guidelines just instill more fear because we still don't understand the whys and the why nots. So in this video, I'm not saying the way I can is the way you need to can. I'm not saying that if you follow all the recommended guidelines that, you, that I'm a better person than you are. You can the way you are comfortable and I'll can the way that I am comfortable. But remember, if you are fearful, learning to understand what is driving your fear is the biggest way to overcome it. So what I'm going to do today is explain in layman's terms because I'm not a professional. I just have a lot of experience putting up food for my family. So I'm gonna explain in layman's terms some of the things that drive the fear behind pressure canning food. So the first thing that happens is you're inspired. You see a picture of somebody's pantry and you're like, I want to can food for my family. Or you might be inspired by something less fun and you might be inspired by finding foods at the grocery store but not being pleased with the ingredient list. So that might be your insp inspiration. So the very first thing that happens is you're inspired. And then the next thing that happens is you take action. You buy your supplies and then you start canning. And at first you follow all the instructions, which is perfectly normal because you're new. After you start canning, you're going to make mistakes. The skill does not become your own unless you make your own mistakes and grow your skill based on what you learned from your mistakes. So after action, you can always, always guarantee that you're gonna make some mistakes. Is it gonna be siphoning and jars that don't seal? Whatever it is. And then, of course, the very last step is you've, you've got the skill mastered to the point where you can teach it to the next generation or to others because you understand all the whys and hows behind it. But without a lot of practice of your skills, you're not gonna understand the whys and hows behind it and you're gonna remain in that fearful place of needing to follow all the rules. So one of the mistakes that you might be thinking you could make is improperly canning, pressure canning, low acid foods and poisoning your family. I, like I said in last week's video, I didn't even know what the word botulism meant 
until I started seeing canning videos from non Mennonite people on Instagram. And I had to go and look up what the word botulism meant. So botulism is a bacteria that thrives in low oxygen or zero oxygen environments. So in the soil, under the soil, in, the, in seas and rivers, that's where the bacteria thrives. And then it can give off spores that can live on, say, fish or veggies that you get from the garden. And these spores will lay dormant until they get into a low oxygen environment like your canned goods. Remember last week how we talked about um, how you create a, create a vacuum and that seals your jar and then in that little headspace, there's no oxygen. So low acid, low acid foods with zero oxygen is where botulism can grow and thrive. Now, here are the things that people don't talk about and that you might not know about botulism. There is 110 cases in the whole United States each, in the United States each year. And 25% of those are from are foodborne. And this includes honey and corn syrup. And then if you research a little further, 20% of all botulism cases are from raw honey and corn syrup. That means that there's 5% that is from other foods. That is how slim the chances are of botulism. Here's the other thing. When you ingest botulism, the healthy immune system in almost all people is going to attack that bacteria immediately and it's never going to have a chance to give off those toxic spores. So even if you ingest botulism, which the chances are slim, your body's going to take care of it before you even know what happened. Infants under 12 months and adults with compromised immune systems are more likely to suffer from botulism than anyone else. So, but like I'm saying, you do your own research and then you decide if the risks are worth the effort or if the risks outweigh the benefits or benefits outweigh the risks. But for me and my family, we are not scared of botulism at all. Number one, um, in the soil, in our garden, the, like we till our garden and it mostly lives in soil that isn't tilled and disturbed, like deep under the, under the soil. Um, because when you bring it to oxygen, it shortens its life. It shortens the bacteria's life because it cannot thrive where there is oxygen. And honestly, my children have all been going to the garden since they were babies. And you know in that baby stage when they're constantly putting their hands in their mouth, their immune system likely knows exactly what to do when it comes across a botulism bacteria if they would ever come across a botulism bacteria, their immune system probably know, already knows exactly what to do with it because the immune system is intelligent like that. If it comes across something that it has met before, it already has built up immunity towards that and it just sends all those cells out to fight that bacteria that it has already encountered before. It knows what to do. Anyway, moving on to understanding the pounds of pressure and the food and the time. Like, most people get very concerned about making sure that they're, they did the proper amount of pressure for the proper amount of time. And, and if, they don't, if they don't meet all those requirements, they're very quick to be fearful or throw their food out. So I'm going to walk you through some of these so that you hopefully um, you will be able to take the next step beyond inspiration and take action. So if you are fortunate enough, fortunate enough to live in an area where um, you have Mennonite stores, you may have come across some of their cookbooks. And this is my current stack of favorite Mennonite cookbooks. And I'm sorry I can't link them because most of them are just within their stores and you can't get them in bookstores or places like that. But almost all of them 
have a section for canning and preserving. And most of their low acid foods will say water bath for three hours or pressure can for a certain amount of time at pressure. Because a lot of the Mennonites do not pressure can or some of them do not pressure can. So what happens when you water bath? Um, boiling water will only reach 212 degrees and it will not go any higher than that. And when you pressure can, the pressure within your pressure canner and within your jars can reach 240 to 250 degrees. Well, since we know that boiling water will never get that temperature high enough, that is why we pressure can. So in a pressure canner at your 10 to 15 pound pressure range, your internal temperature is going to reach 240 to 250 degrees. So that is plenty hot enough to kill your botulism bacteria. 240 to 250 degrees when there is pressure. So all that to say, that is why I don't stress a whole lot about time and pressure like the differences because I know that with 240 degrees at 10 pounds, botulism spores start to die. Now the difference is in the density of your food. Like things, let's say like big chunks of, of beef. It's going to take longer for the internal temperature of that beef chunk to reach 185 degrees and stay there for 10 minutes than it is for something like ground beef to reach that same temperature. And that's where your time differences come in. That's where you'll see recipes like 90 minutes at 12 pounds of pressure because that is how long regulations say that it takes for the internal temperature of that chunk of beef to reach, to stay at a high temperature long enough to kill botulism spores. In the Mennonite cookbooks, they will have things that, they'll have recipes that say, you can do this ground beef at 90, at 10 pounds of pressure for 90 minutes, or you can do it at 15 pounds of pressure for half that time. So understanding why you pressure can is going to give you a whole lot more confidence and freedom when you understand why things need to be pressure canned. So let's say that you improperly can some potatoes. Potatoes had the skins on and the botulism spores, the bacteria spores were present on the skin and then you improperly canned it and now in that low oxygen environment, those, that bacteria is multiplying because it's low oxygen. Well, ingesting the bacteria itself is not going to make you sick. But the, the toxin that this, the spores give off is what can make you sick. So let's say you get this food and you're going to eat it and you're not going to heat it first. So let's say you're going to open a jar of these potatoes and you're going to ingest them. And... If your body does not recognize this toxin and take care of it before it starts making you ill, that is when you would get ill. So if you're still worried, if you're still concerned, guess what? That toxin, so the bacteria, the reason we have to pressure can it at such a high temperature is to kill the bacteria spores. But let's say you didn't do that. Let's say you did not, you improperly canned these potatoes. The bacteria and the spores were present. Guess what? The toxin that these spores give off can be inactivated or killed. This toxin can be inactivated where it won't make you sick by boiling and heating the product to boiling. So let's say you improperly, you're improperly canned potatoes. You're going to put them into a cast iron frying pan with some butter and you're gonna fry them up until they're nice and crispy. That's hot enough to kill the toxin that could make you sick. Ingesting the botulism spore itself is not gonna make you sick. It's the toxin that the spores give off that will make you sick. And that toxin can be inactivated by cooking your product. And one of the most popular questions is, what are low acid foods? Can we have a list of low acid foods? 
And in last week's water bathing video, in the description, I put a printable sheet with water bathing tips and a list of high acid foods. In today's video, I will put a printable sheet of pressure canning tips and tricks and hacks and a list of low acid foods that should be pressure canned. Another question is um, canning soups. I have not canned any soups where you mix all the ingredients together in probably since the first five years of our marriage. And here's why. So to feed my family, I need approximately four quarts of food so to make one meal. So for me, um, a can of beef, you know, cubed beef, a can of potatoes, a can of green beans, a can of tomato juice, and a pint of carrots makes a nice big pot of soup for my family. And we actually prefer to can our ingredients separately and then put them all together. Because when, say let's, I'm canning beef stew, Carrots and potatoes and green beans don't need to be pressure canned as long as meat does. So what happens is when you can meat, when you can soup, you need to pressure can it for the densest food. So in this case, it would be the beef, which is, I think, just off the top of my head, I think it's around an hour for pressure canning beef. Um, I'd have to look. But... So an hour versus the 20 minutes that I normally do for green beans, the green beans and potatoes and carrots are going to be mush. And my family is funny about their textures. So I don't can a whole lot of soups all together in one quart jar just for those reasons. But in the back of the Mennonite cookbooks, they have lots of soups to can. They have a lot of recipes for canning, pressure canning different kinds of soups. One of the questions was, my pressure canner does not have a pressure gauge, but what you get then is a little weight with the different um, temperature, the different pressures on it. So if you wanna can something at 15 pounds pressure, you'll put the 15 pound weight on and that'll let just enough steam out as it jiggles back and forth to keep the internal pressure at 15 pounds. So you just have to trust your weight and go with what, if it has a 10 pound weight, if it calls for 10 pounds of pressure, you'll put your 10 pound weight on and then you'll just trust that even though you can't see the gauge, the internal pounds of pressure is at 10 pounds. Personally, I like the ones with a gauge just because that's what I was used to. So I'm used to checking the gauge and making sure my pressure is staying where it's at, where it's supposed to be. Would I buy a used pressure canner? And would I get the gauge tested? Um, obviously I started out with a used pressure canner. It was one that my mom um, gave to me and I didn't get the gauge tested because, you know, she used it and trusted it. So I just, you know, went with that. However, if I buy one at a yard sale, like I bought this Presto at a yard sale, but it was brand new. I didn't get the gauge tested. If you want to get the gauge tested, there's no harm in that. I personally wouldn't because I feel like I understand pressure canning enough and I've done it enough that I could tell if it was way off. And I don't worry too much about two pounds off or on like my old pressure canner that I use the gauge didn't even go all the way down anymore um, to zero so I knew it was a little off but that was okay I just compensated on the other end a little bit um, so I probably wouldn't get the gauge tested unless I was suspicious that it was way off but otherwise if you un start understanding pressure canning that takes some fear out of that too out of is my gauge correct do pressure canned foods retain less nutrients? I think the simple answer to that is yes. I believe heating something to 240 and 250 degrees definitely destroys some nutrients. Um, but when you look at it, the big picture of, for me, there's two things. I don't have enough freezer space to preserve all the vegetables that I want for my family for a year. The foods that we do pressure can are not all of them. So we're not destroying all the nutrients in all our canned food. 
So let's take green beans for instance. The green beans grown in my garden never get sprayed with anything and we haven't sprayed in our garden in all the years that we've lived here. So let's assume, let's take, let's say they're organic green beans because of all that. I harvest them and preserve them within probably a five hour window. So I'm still better off. I'm still feeding my family better by feeding them those pressure canned green beans that were preserved within five hours of picking than I am buying a can of, 18 can of green beans from the grocery store that have been chemically treated and then picked and trucked for hundreds of miles and canned in a factory. I would still rather grow produce and pressure can it than buy from the store and or buy fresh all season it from the grocery store because what I can buy fresh at the grocery store has been picked probably a week ago. They've been refrigerated and not only that, that they've been chemically treated. So yes, maybe the ones from the grocery store that you buy fresh in January might have more nutrients than the ones I pressure canned from my garden, but they also have a lot of toxins from being chemically treated that I rather would rather not feed to my family. If you're pressure canning tomato products, do you still need to add acid? If I were to pressure can my tomato products, I wouldn't even worry about adding any extra acid. And I talked um, in length about water bathing tomato products in last week's video, which I will make sure is linked so you can find it easily. But the whole reason you add acid to tomato products is so that you can water bath can them. If you're pressure canning them, then no, you don't need to add any extra acid to any tomato products if you are pressure canning them. Okay, altitude changes and how it affects and why it affects the um, pounds of pressure that you need when you're pressure canning. So with water bathing, when your altitude is higher, you need to water bath for a, a longer amount of time. Whereas with pressure canning, when you live in a high altitude or a higher altitude, the higher your altitude is, the more pounds of pressure you're going to need. And here is why. With the higher altitudes, the air is thinner. So it takes more air to create the same, to reach the same temperature. So the thinner air, so thin, think, think thin versus dense. The denser the air is, the easier it packs in here. The faster it packs in here and brings the temperature up. And the thinner the air is, the more of it takes. If you've ever gone up into the mountains, you know what it, how much of that thin air it takes to fill your lungs and make you feel like you're getting enough oxygen if you're used to living in a more dense air climate. So that's the only reason the, the pounds of pressure changes for altitude is because it takes more of that air. So you need more pounds of it to reach the same, to make the temperature equivalent that kills your botulism spores, possible botulism spores. So let's say you're pressure canning and your pressure canner doesn't have a gauge. Um, so then you just go with the, like say your altitude calls for, the recipe calls for 10 pounds, but your altitude says, you know, 12 go with your 15 pound weight if you don't have a 12 pound weight. So always go up a little bit, just err on the side of caution if you don't have a gauge to tell you exactly where your pressure is staying. So I have two questions that kind of go hand in hand. Can everything be pressure canned? And how to go beyond canning recipes that you find in books and go rogue with your canning. Um, so you can, do pressure canning for all your preserving. I don't because time and resources, pressure canning takes much more time than water bathing because you have to bring your pressure up. It's my cheese timer. <laughs> I'm making cheese again. 
So you have to pray, bring your pressure up and then you have to babysit it, babysit it for anywhere from 20 to 90 minutes. And then when it's done, you have to wait for your pressure to come down. So doing seven quarts in a pressure canner is gonna take up a whole lot more of my time and mental resources because I have to babysit it than water bath canning is because water bathing is usually like 20 minutes, anywhere from 10 to 45 minutes. And I can set my timer and I can hear that that water keeps boiling. I can go on and do other things while that is happening. And then as soon as my time is up, I can lift that, those jars out of the boiling water bath and put fresh jars in and I can keep going. So that is one reason I don't want to pressure can everything is because pressure canning is much more of a time and resources investment, mental resources and time and also nutrients. I want to preserve as many nutrients as I can. So I'm definitely not going to choose to pressure can something that I could water bath because like I stated earlier, definitely heating something to such a high temperature will kill some nutrients. And then how to go beyond the rest, canning recipes and go rogue. So like I said, I haven't done mixed soups and things like that in years, but when I do, I will look for guidelines on each individual thing. So let's take um, like a beef stew or a vegetable stew. So beef chunks, potatoes, carrots, um, maybe you're adding some dry beans. You wanna make sure that you look up the temperature and pressure guidelines for all your individual things. And you can put them all together in a jar and then just can them according to what the, the most pressure and the most time. So probably your dry beans or your meat in this you know rogue recipe that I'm thinking up as I'm talking. So probably your dried beans or your meat would be the most time. So you would can the entire quart for that amount of time at that amount of pressure. And then you can go rogue. But another question, timing of your steam valve. So when your steam starts coming out, then they're like you let it steam for say 15 minutes. That has little to nothing to do with your end result. The only reason you're letting steam come out is so that you know there's enough heat in here that when you put your valve on that the pressure is gonna start building. If I've even done, you know, like when I was teaching Hadassah and kind of letting her do her own thing, you know, letting her get accustomed to it, she put the, the weight on before there was steam coming out. And all that happened is it took a lot longer than we expected for the pressure to come up to where we want it. So the only reason that they say let the steam come out for a while is so that you know you're already, you've got steam building up in here, which is going to make your pressure. So I never time how much, how long I let it steam. I just, after all these years, know that when the steam starts coming out fairly viciously, it's time. And um, you can put it on whenever. Minimum that I let it steam is probably five minutes. And if I let it only steam for five minutes before I put my weight on. It just takes longer for your pressure to build. And I honestly think 15 minutes for myself is too long because then when I put the weight on and then the pressure builds so fast, I would rather have it build pressure a little slower because I want to be able to manipulate my burner. And when the pressure builds too fast, I don't have as much like I'm, I'm turning my burner too far one way or too far the other way. And personally, I like for my pressure to build slower. So I don't let it steam out 15 minutes because I want to put my weight on before it's steaming very viciously. So one of the other questions were, um, why do you not need a lot of water in the bottom of a pressure canner? So rule, I know there's a lot of, um, you know, some say if you have a 23 quart pressure canner, you need to add X and X, of, you know, quarts of water. For myself, I don't measure how much water I add. I just add water until it's covering the bottom one inch of the jar. And all you need is water in there so it doesn't boil dry. And the whole rest of the space is going to be built 
is going to be pressure. So you're not canning with water. That's why you only need a little bit of water in the bottom to keep everything, you know, to keep it moist in there. And the rest of it is all for pressure because you're using pressure. If you are using too much water, you are not going to be able to keep your pressure up because there's not enough room to keep your pressure. There's not enough air in there to keep the pressure up. So too much water will have you struggling to keep your pressure where you want it. Minimum amount of jars that I would put in my pressure canner. Well, I think that you can probably pressure can as little as two jars. Um, I don't need to pressure can only two jars because if I only have two jars left, um, they will just go in my refrigerator and I'll use them fresh. But I'm cooking for a lot more people. Personally, if I have three quarts, I'll put them in my pressure canner and can them. Anything under than three just goes in my fridge and we eat it fresh. Do I pressure can any leftovers? I do not. Like, because, like I said, my family is funny about texture. And if I had a vegetable soup that I heated up and now there's leftovers, you could pressure can it. Pressure can, here again, look at what's in your soup and then pressure can it for the amount of time, the longest amount of time that any of your ingredients requires, probably the meat. And so what will happen is that soup will basically um, be a mush, any vegetables that are thoroughly cooked and then pressure can for 45, 60, 90 minutes are going to be mush. My family is not a fan of mushy vegetables. So when I have leftovers, they go into freezer containers and go straight into the freezer. I do not can leftovers, but that doesn't mean you can't. Can you can meat from the freezer? Yes, when I need room in my freezer and you know, say we're harvesting something and our freezers are full, I will go get you know, some roasts, cut them up and can stew meat. And you, of course, want to be careful that you, you know, thaw them in the refrigerator and then cut them and can them right away. Um, but any bacteria that could grow on your meat while you're thawing it will be killed at 240 and 250 degrees. So yes, I can meat after it's frozen. Okay, I have time for a couple more questions. Um, one was, what if your pressure goes too high or too low? And that has absolutely happened to me. I don't worry too much if it goes too high. I just keep counting time and, you know, adjust my burner. If it goes too low, I'm, I'm more particular about letting it go too low. But if it falls a couple pounds under my, uh, you know, the pressure that I want it. So let's say I want it at 12 and it falls to 9. I don't worry about it. I just, you know, adjust my pressure accordingly. As long as it doesn't fall all the way down to zero, I don't start my timer over. And it has even happened like on my Camp Chef, my outside propane burner, where I run out of propane and didn't know it and I was halfway through pressure canning. I just started, started changed out the propane, started it again, brought it up to pressure and finished out my time that way. But it doesn't, I did that because I don't want mushy product. And, but if you wanna start all over, it's not gonna hurt anything to start all over. If, you're safe, if you feel safer to start your timer all over, that's fine. You're not gonna hurt anything by doing that. So what is, your, what is the shelf life of canned foods? And I covered this briefly in my water bathing video, but the shelf life for us, for our family, is probably three years max. Not saying that um, we won't eat it after three years, it's just that's kind of my goal. If, I, if we haven't used something in three years, I will definitely look for ways to use it, to get it used up. And it's not like it's going to go bad, it's just that I know that it, it starts losing some nutrients the longer it's canned. But I wouldn't say we're in a really tight spot. You know, we've had droughts or we weren't able to, you know, raise a beef. Um, I would not hesitate to use our canned beef or our canned chicken after four or five, eight years on the shelf. As long as the CO is good, the food is not going to hurt you. I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of pressure canning. 
Um, and I don't have anything to pressure can today. I'm going to show you what I do have to do today in a little bit, but I don't have anything to pressure can, but I'm going to link all the videos that I have where I am using my pressure canner and you can go and watch those. Um, but I'm going to do a real quick walkthrough to, cause hopefully that will help somebody that might not have time to go watch the other videos. So I'm going to put one in. And let's say I'm pressure canning green beans, right? So I've got my green beans, got them all packed in the jars. My lids are tight. And somebody asked, How, what is finger tight? And so for me, finger tight is you turn and as soon as you've got it tight, you let go. You don't do that extra, I gotta make this really tight so it doesn't leak. You don't do that extra. You just turn it on like you would a mayonnaise jar before you put it into the fridge. You just make it tight. So you fill this with your seven jars of green beans. And I will link my green bean canning video for you. And then you pour water in. Now, room temperature, if your jars are at room temperature, you can add tap water as hot as you want and it's not gonna hurt your jars unless you know there's a crack or something already in them. Room temperature jars, you don't have to be careful with what temperature water you're adding. So for me, because I like to make my steps count and go as fast as I can, if I have room temperature green bean jars, the water that I'm gonna put in here is gonna be as hot as I can get it from my tap and i'm not covering my jars with that hot water you know i'm just filling the water to the bottom one inch to cover the bottom one inch of the jars because remember we're canning with pressure so i'm gonna put all my jars in i'm gonna put hot tap water why am i using hot because it's gonna speed up the process if it, if you don't have to spend 10 minutes getting that those couple quarts of water hot so i'm gonna put hot tap water in until it covers the bottom one inch of my jar. See your lid has an arrow and that arrow mark gets lined up with this because then there's this little safety bracket that hooks under here. And then you're gonna flip all of these up. And of course I've got my bur burner turned on high while I'm doing this because I don't wanna waste any time. I wanna get that water hot as fast as I can. Not because it matters in the end, with your product because my time matters and I want to I want to make my steps count. So I turn my burner on high right away and get that water going while I do the lid. And then when you start tightening them, you're going to start on opposite ends and you're going to tighten these and you're just going to put them down again. So you're not going to tighten them fully cuz you want this lid to get tightened tightened evenly all the way around. And then you're going to do these two opposite and you're going to make them just just down against and then you're going to do these and then you start with your first ones and you give them another turn you give each one of them one more turn and you just keep going around giving them each one more turn until they're all as tight as you can make them so you've got your burner on high and you're getting your water heated up and you know what happens, that water in there is going to start boiling and steam's going to start coming out of here. So once you've got a good amount of steam coming out, you can put your weight on. So green beans are 10 pounds of pressure. So I'm going to put 10 pounds on there and this weight will help keep my, um, my gauge where I want it because it will let a little bit of steam out if it needs to and then I'll just keep my burner at on high until I get to the 10 pounds of pressure. And then I'm gonna play with that 10 to 12 pound range and adjust my pressure. But I do not adjust my, my burner until I'm really close to 10 pounds because I don't care if it goes over 10 pounds a little bit. I, that's just my, my little playground that I use to adjust my temperature. When you get close to 10 is when I start babysitting it and adjusting so that I can find that sweet spot and keep it at you know a steady 20, 10 pounds of pressure for 20 minutes. But even, even so, I set my timer, like say I'm canning green beans, I set my timer for every five minutes if I'm not gonna be in the kitchen. And every five minutes, I go and I check my pressure canner. Or if you watch some of my more recent videos where Hadassah has mastered the pressure canning, she will pull up a chair 
and a storybook and she will babysit my pressure canner for me and this frees me up to do other jobs so then you reach your um your 20 minutes we're canning green beans you reach your 20 minutes, you're gonna turn your burner off. If you have a Presto, you're just gonna slowly bring your pressure down. But if you have a big cast aluminum All-American, you can turn your burner off and your, your gauge will just slowly come down because this holds so much heat and pressure and it'll stay trapped in there just like a cast iron pan stays warm. So then um, once your pressure reaches zero, you are going to loosen this. First of all, you're gonna take your weight off and, and, and it might go and have a little pressure come out there and that's fine. So after you take your weight off, you're gonna loosen all of these. And then you're gonna turn your lid so that it unlatches and lift it. Sometimes mine kind of gets stuck and doesn't um, want to lift real well, but don't ever grease this because that'll hurt your, that'll keep it from sealing. So don't grease this. What I do if I can't get my lid off is I take a, a flat screwdriver and just, and go like you say right in here, use it like a pry bar and lift the lid a little bit and then it lets loose and I can lift my lid off. So then you're gonna take your can grabber and you're gonna set all your jars out on a you know cutting board you wanna protect your Formica or your countertop because if you put seven hot jars on your countertop, it is going to affect your countertop. So I usually put down a tea towel or a cutting board, lift all my jars out, and then you can put fresh jars back in. The water is not going to be too hot for room temperature jars. So then you're ready to start over and then you put your jars in. After you have your jars in, you're gonna check and make sure you probably have to add a little more water because some of it will have evaporated while you pressure canned your last batch of green beans. So then you're gonna put your next batch of jars in and you're gonna start all over using all the same steps. Once your jars are room temperature, I remove the rings and store them in our cold room or your pantry wherever you store your jars. So once they're room temperature, you're good to go. You have canned green beans. So there is my pressure canning video. Thank you everybody for watching. I hope you learned something and I look forward to communicating with you in the comments.